Hi everyone, this is Dr. Victoria Neverly, and here with me is Ms. Jocelyn Omondi, who is also the Director for Legal Aid at the African Energy and Minerals Management Initiative. So in this webinar today, we're going to, she's going to take us through the issue of public participation in the extractive industries. And I understand she has written a policy brief about public participation with the Extractives Hub, which is based at the Center for Energy, Petroleum, Mineral and Policy. But before she starts on her presentation, I would like her to briefly introduce herself. Ms. Jocelyn, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Victoria. My name is Ms. Jocelyn Omondi. I am an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, and um, I have studied international oil, gas, law, and policy at the University of Dundee at the center. Also, I am an associate of um, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I am also a um, chartered um, mediator uh, from um, MIT, yes. And then I am also the legal aid director at AMI, which um, Dr. Victoria has just mentioned. So in my discussion today, I will be speaking on the issue of public participation in the extractive um, industry. So basically, I'll just, just allow me to share some slides. Um, I don't know, can you see? Sorry, can you see them? Just a minute. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you, Dr. Victoria. Oh. This is the red button that has share screen down. Yes, 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 I can, but I, I don't know why it's not um sharing. Just a minute. Okay. Let me see if I can share my instead. Can you share them from your side? Yeah, no, let me try to get them from my email. Okay, okay, let me try. So. Anyway, in the meantime, you can just give us a brief of what you wrote about as I'm looking for. Yes, yes, actually, let me just uh, start on. Okay. Yes, so basically, um, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about uh, public participation in the extractives industry. So I will speak on four limbs of um, this presentation about the overview of public participation, the legal framework in the African perspective, the challenges uh, faced in conducting effective public participation and public participation in the, extra, in the energy transition. So basically, we could define um, public participation as the process by which citizens and individuals, groups or communities are involved in the conduct of public affairs, whereby they interact with the government, other non-governmental agencies with a view to influence decisions, uh, policies, uh, decision making in the extractive industry. Yes. Okay. Third slide now, yeah? Yes, yes, the third slide. Okay. Yes, there, that's fine. So basically we have, there's a, there's a big difference between um, conducting public participation and conducting effective public participation. The reason as to why I'm saying this is because most um, um, extractive industry projects conduct public participation with the view of conducting it as a formality rather than following the guiding principles um, guided by legislation that is are already in existence. So we should be in a position to 
um, conduct effective public participation following the due process rather than um, conducting it because um, we are supposed to conduct public participation. Because lately we have seen many cases which have come up um, uh, challenging the effective public participation uh, and projects, which I'm going to explain in um, this presentation. So we do know that energy investment projects are long-term in nature. Therefore, they require um, proper communication between the project proponents. The project proponents involve, um, uh, for example, like maybe in the oil and gas sector, we have project proponents like the national oil company. We have um, we have the um, international oil companies, we have the local communities, we have the stakeholders, both um, the, the local community and the non-governmental non agencies. So this is very important. We need a lot of cooperation between these um, project proponents so that we can conduct effective public participation. So moving on to the legal framework um, governing effective public participation. So we do have existing laws in the African perspective, whereby we have the constitution. The constitution usually provides for um, many um, provisions on public participation. However, there is a very big loophole in the existing laws because the laws do have, um, the laws are good and they, they, they should be enforced. Rather, what we see right now happening is that um, these laws, they're very good in paper and um, in the drafting. However, when it comes to the enforcement um, step, it's a very big problem. So what we should do is um, have proper uh, enforcement and uh, supervision mechanisms in this sector so that we are able to conduct effective public participation from the onset of conception of these projects. So moving on to the challenges which are faced and in conducting effective public participation. Um, I'll just highlight most of these challenges because they are, these challenges cut across through the cases which I'm going to list in my presentation. So um, the first ch main challenge is lack of access to information. We, we have seen there's a very, very big problem in regards to uh, accessing information. And this, go, this point goes hand in hand with um, the centralization and confidentiality of agreements. So the reason as to why I'm seeing this is because if you see the Turkana oil project back in Kenya, there, there is a big problem mm -hmm. in access to information. And this is brought about by, we do have signed contracts of um, production sharing contracts. However, when it comes to the public asking for this information so that they are able to understand the kind of contracts um, which the country or the, um, the uh, national oil company has entered into, then there is a big problem because the public does not understand what exactly is happening. Therefore, they are not involved um, as required by law uh, on public participation. Then there's also the issue of gender discrimination, whereby we find that most of even the local content um, um, policies, they have um, a very big challenge in regards to gender discrimination. And this was also seen in the same project in um, the Turkana oil um, project. And, especially more particularly in the Lapset um, development project in the pipeline project. Then we also have, as I've just mentioned, it's the lack of civic education to our public. The public does not, uh, is not well informed on um, the extractive industry uh, project development. Um, as I've said, most of these uh, contracts are centralized and they're very confidential. But at the same time, we could still have this, um, the negotiations themselves are confidential that I'm not um, disagreeing. However, we should be able to have um, a mechanism in which the public is able to access this information um, on the public domain because we do have the right as enshrined under the constitution. And then they, there are a lot of land issues and cultural differences when it comes to the issue of public participation. And this is brought up by, again, I'm, I'll still reference the, the Lapset project because I have done um, research in this area and um, I came up with very many findings, um, which I am highlighting in the course of this um, 
discussion. So when it comes to uh, the cultural issues, when you see the Turkana community, they are um, pastoralist community and they have a very big cultural her heritage, which um, is very uh, close to them. So th by the time when um, this um, Kenya Gazette notices uh, were kept uh, up for accessing mm -hmm. the land where the pipeline was going to pass by, that brought up a very big challenge because um, the, the National Land Commission did not um, tell the local communities what will happen to their to their cultural and, uh, and ancestral heritage. Um, in addition to this, um, we also see that the, there is a limited time frame in conducting the process of public participation. Public participation should not be a one-off process. It's a process that should continue from the point of conceptualization of the project until the end of the project, because there are very many loopholes that come up uh, in this project. And it is very important to have um, grievance mechanisms because when um, submitting the bids and then international oil companies mostly they're usually um, supposed to provide public participation plans which are supposed to be assessed and supervised by the by the, um, the by the ministry so this is something which should be taken into consideration um, at the very um, utmost um, importance. So there are also environmental and health concerns which have also come up in regards to public participation. And at the end of the day, if we, if we do not conduct effective public participation by involving the local communities and the public on this issue, then we are not able to um, address their key concerns and um, the challenges that they are facing in regards to the um, to this extractive industry projects. So there is inadequate um, legislation on public participation. I will give again the example of um, of Kenya. We do have the public participation bill, yes, but it has it's still in parliament. It still has not been. Um, implemented but the main challenge which um i would like to identify with this bill is that most of these um laws even the county government act the constitution um the public participation bill um all these bills and acts that are in existence they do have the the, the provision for conducting public participation. However, the main challenge is there is a loophole in the process itself because many of us are going to have different notions on how to conduct public participation, but we need proper guidelines on how exactly um, to conduct this process from the conception to the end because as it is right now, we do not have a clear process or guideline as to how to uh, conduct effective public participation in the extractive industry. So moving on to the case studies, as I have mentioned, we have the county government of Turkana versus the National Land Commission. And this is uh, this was the case which I did um, in my dissertation. I, I will be able to share with um, those who are interested in in um, this uh, write-up, which I did, then the same the same same thing is happening also in the coal mining because um, in Kenya the, there's the coal mining in Lamu and also the the Kitui coal mining, and these projects were actually uh, taken to court, and the local communities took these uh, projects to court, and they were actually stopped because of lack of effective public participation. So we do see that this is a trend which has been set that most of um, the project proponents are not actually conducting effective public participation as the way they are supposed to conduct it. And now we see that there's a very big problem in regards to um, doing effective public participation. We should stop this trend of always taking um, um, this um, 
process for granted. Rather, we should focus on doing it right at the onset of the conceptualization of the project. So these challenges have resulted into political and civil unrest, delays on final investment decisions, a lack of trust between the levels of government as we as, um, as it's very evident in the National Government of Turkana and the National Land Commission, a case which was um, just the, the ruling was delivered around uh, last year, April 2019. So we 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 do need uh, a lot of um, a lot of um, concentration in this area of public participation. So now moving on to the energy, my my perspective on the energy transition. Um, we can go down. Yes. So now public participation and um, energy transition transition. So my discussion mainly is about um, the African context. So there is this energy dilemma in which um, many of us are saying, oh, yes, Africa is supposed to move into um, energy transition. But what exactly are we transitioning from? Because um, Africa is right now, most of the, of the African countries are exploiting their reserves, their natural resources. So I wouldn't say per se that we are transitioning, but rather I would quote uh, Dr. Victoria in this, um, as she stated in one of her webinars on the notion on energy progression. We would rather say that we are progressing in, in the sense that we are still exploiting our natural resources and that includes fossil fuels. And at the same time, we are also um, developing our renewable sources of energy. Africa has abundance of um, uh, natural and uh, renewable resources, wind, we have solar, we have hydro, we have geothermal, all that. So there is need to integrate these public policies for sustainable development in African countries with high fossil fuel use and um, the, the countries which uh, use little to no uh, fossil fuels. This is um, very evident like in Nigeria. Nigeria has a lot of gas flaring and if there is regional cooperation between all these um, between the African countries, that gas that is being flared is able to sustain that region with um, good um, energy demand because we do have um, energy um, demands in Africa, but then um, we need to strategize good proper um, policies and um, regional development plans in order to sustain our energy demands. So as just as I've mentioned, there is the need for regional cooperation between African countries in order to meet the energy demands and address the issue on uh, access to energy. So this would be my takeaway from this uh, presentation. And yes, um, for this, my the, my um, write-up that I wrote to the Extractives Hub, and uh, it's accessible. The link is down there. I could share my my slides on with those who are interested. Thank you very much, Dr. Victoria. Thank you very much, Dr. Jocelyn. So I see there are some participants. Is there anyone with a question? Let me just promote them to ensure that they can talk. Anyone who has a question for Jocelyn, please raise it before we can move forward. I see Cynthia, I see Joel, and I see Jesters. Any remarks on Jocelyn's presentation before I move on? All right, they're all quiet. So I'll, I would like to engage your Jocelyn more mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. issue of public participation, because in most cases we've seen public participation focused on extractives, that is oil, gas, and mining. And now with the new era of energy transitions and climate change, mm -hmm. my question is, how do we ensure that the public actually actively get involved in these new developments with respect to uh, transitioning into a low carbon economy and also making them understand the importance of energy transitions, mm -hmm. given the fact that uh, most people in sub-Saharan Africa, especially in rural areas, most of them rely on firewood, so they would not really understand what are we transitioning from when that's all we need is electricity. So what's your son that? Yes, so in regards to 
uh, the energy transition and public participation. This is actually an area which I'm very interested in. So um, when, it, when it comes to, you see energy transition is something that is still um, being progressed and right now would be the best time to actually do the public participation because when it comes to the governmental agencies, they have dockets on on conducting effective public participation. They should be able to mobilize all the communities and, but not just do it in a, commun in a communal way. I, I feel like um, this public participation in regards to energy transition should be done as a regional, uh, on a regional basis in country, countries should come together and form a regional policies on, um, the energy transition, because at the end of the day, if we if we leave um, some countries um, moving to renewable energy and others are still moving, are still um, doing their fossil fuels, then there is going to be a problem because climate change is something that is a global problem. So if we do not address it as a regional, on a regional basis, then I don't think we're really helping each other in in regards to this um, energy transition. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And what about the issue of um, the political will? Like, cause in most cases, when we talk about, when we're talking about energy, like the governments are really involved. So we have the governments and also uh, the investors themselves, mm -hmm. and we want the public to be involved. So do you think we have the political will to ensure that our governments back in Africa can actually embrace public participation? Well, now this all roots down to good governance. If we have good governance structures and mechanisms, then we do have that political will to um, do effective public participation. But also at the same time, we need to know that in, in this investment, uh, in the extractive industry, um, this docket of public participation is actually left to, like, like, for example, like in the oil and gas sector is left to like the, um, the IOCs, they're the ones who are left in charge with um, the docket of public participation, but it should not be done in isolation. That's why we say that there should be a lot of cooperation and um, between these key project proponents, because if the international oil company is the one that is left with um, this docket, or it's the same thing with the energy trans transition. If it's the if it's the project proponent that is left with that docket, they cannot do it in, in isolation. Because at the end of the day, if you're doing public participation, you need to inculcate the views of the local community. You need to inculcate the views of the relevant stakeholders who are involved. So therefore, there's that cooperation which needs to be promoted. And in regards to policy formulation, those these, these policies should actually be formed and developed right now with a view to engaging the public on all these challenges which are being faced in the energy sector. Thank you, Jocelyn. I see Cynthia has a question. Cynthia, please go ahead. Um, hi, Jocelyn. Uh, hi. I think I was quite late, so I'm not so sure I, I will probably answer this question. Mm -hmm. But um, just on the realm of public participation, what would you say? I know Kenya, for instance, mm -hmm. has, um, like you said, there are no clear parameters as to, and, and the legislation is still not yet, um, has not yet become law. But why, especially uh, like Dr. Victoria said, if you were to explain to some, someone the scope of public participation, maybe in your studies, if you come through uh, probably at what other jurisdictions do, as to, um, say like in the Lamu coal plant case, uh, when you ask the investor, they will say, we asked a few people or a few civil society groups knew. So what would you define to be the proper scope um, of public participation for you to say, okay, indeed public participation was undertaken as opposed to, um, you know, running the risk of a community saying, oh, we didn't know civil society coming to say, we didn't know. And my second question is, is still on public participation, how would you deal with divergent views of people who um, are aware of the project? Say you conduct public participation, but say you have uh, divergent views or people who do not, maybe the majority is say your project succeeds, but there are divergent views. How would you propose to deal with that? 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Cynthia, for your question. So dealing with um, divergent views, at the end of the day, we, we will have um, different opinions on, on how to conduct um, this process of public participation. However, um, and I'll give a very good example as to the divergent views on who exactly a stakeholder is, because um, when conducting this process, you cannot literally involve the whole, like everybody. That's why they're usually um, representatives. And these representatives are identified by the local communities themselves. So when it comes to the different divergent views, they have representatives whom um, the local community identifies. And those are the people whom, like if, if a decision is made, it's made on behalf of, um, of um, the whole entire community. And this being said, when we have all these conflicts, that's why the negotiation is usually there. There's usually the negotiation stage, and then the, there is the, uh, the conduct of the public participation itself. And move, um, this also answers um, your, first quest, your first question, whereby you said what exactly would be um, the ideal process if I if I got your question right what I did what would you term or what would I um, identify with as the ideal process of conducting effective public participation well pu public participation is a process which involves the key project uh, proponents in the project and in the view of decision making which at which at the end of the day leads to the social license to operate. So that being said, when we have, um, when we have um, these processes, as I said, the, the legal framework which is in existence does not provide a clear guideline as to what a public participation process should be undertaken. If you look at the, there is a landmark which I would refer you to, to the Peruvian um, case because they, they did, um, a very good um, legal legislative framework on um, the Casemia project. And that being said, there was a very good um, outline and the process was, was being explained to the, the local communities from the onset until the end of um, the project, taking into consideration their local views and at any point when they had any problem, all that was being um, informed to the to the to the to the pro sorry to the public and to the local government officials. Yes, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Now, the last question we have, because we're running out of time, it's from uh, Justus. He was asking, how do we balance confidentiality and public participation in the energy sector? Well, um, when it comes to confidentiality, confidentiality is mainly in the agreement. When it comes to negotiating this um, extractive industry um, con uh, contracts, which um, the key project proponents usually uh, negotiate, those documents themselves are termed as confidential or rather the negotiation itself is termed as confidential. However, if you look at the, these uh, developed countries, they have a mechanism in which they have um, this, like if you see the production sharing agreements or, or um, the risk sharing agreements, all those agreements um, in the sector, they are kept out in the public domain. So if we say that this, um, documents are confidential and that the public is not supposed to um, be aware of them. And that is exactly what is happening right now in Kenya, is that the public is not aware of the kind of contracts which um, the government has entered into with these um, key project proponents. And I, I feel like this issue on confidentiality should be there should be a clear guideline as to what the public should be able to know because this is something which is in the public domain and which should be in the public domain and the constitution actually does provide that um, these contracts should be uh, led to the public but um, the ministry needs to literally work on this kind of mechanisms, yes. All right, uh, thank you. And then uh, Joel is asking, um, that uh, 
in order to ensure effective public participation, do you think that the government should contract out issues with respect to public participation that is environmental and social impact assessment? I do not feel that they, I, I do not um, feel like um, the government should contract out their issues mm -hmm. because I feel like African issues should be dealt with using African solutions. Because if, mm -hmm. if, if we um, give out all our problems all to, to other people to deal with, for us, then it's not going to be helping us at any point. I feel like we do have the capability, we do have um, the information and the knowledge so that we are able to um, sort out our own internal issues before going outside and seeking for um, assistance from other um, people. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. This marks the end of our webinar. Our participants, if you've missed the first part, uh, the one we've been live on YouTube. Let me just share the link on YouTube so you can watch with your friends or you can share the link with all other people who have missed out. Mm -hmm. So, and if you have any questions, you can still contact Jocelyn. Jocelyn, do you want to share your contact details for people who might want to contact Yes, Yes, um, just... Um... Mary, Mary Obara, what, uh, I see your, your hand is up. Do you want to say something, Mary? As Jocelyn is looking for her contact details. I have sent out my contact details. I've sent my email. <laughs> All right. Mary, I've promoted you so you can speak. All right. I think she's not responding. So this will be the end of our webinar. Thank you very much, our participants. If you've missed out, uh, do check out the video on YouTube. And Jocelyn has shared her email address, which is jocelynagnes at gmail.com. So this marks the end of our webinar and have a lovely morning or afternoon wherever you are. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.